So here we are, the lovely first-gen RX-7. Legendary not for its sheer power, but rather its winning attitude. It was the 1980s and America was loving the Japanese formula, a small car that begged you to drive it hard. It always felt like it was itching for a fight. But the RX-7 was a lightweight Spartan Street Fighter, a bantamweight that could duck and dodge with stamina rather than punch hard trying to catch its breath. It made grown men and women feel young and pretty irresponsible. With the looks that were deeply inspired from its European counterparts, it was a sleek and simple style. Pricing was also very affordable. With all its mechanical features perfectly balanced, it is the RX-7 that started the legacy that we know today and it contributed to a sports car renaissance. So let's take a deeper look at this particular time capsule and catch a glimpse of an 80s icon. So this is a 1983 Mazda RX-7. The owner is Jeff Wighorst. He is a customer of mine. Uh, basically came in to do some work on this car. Uh, I just did a carburetor rebuild some clutch hydraulics and um, various maintenance items like fuel filters, air filter, you know, oil change, coolant, things like that, just to get it up to par and ready to use. Um, there is a movie that's being shot and the car might be in the movie. So we wanted to make sure everything was driving really well and didn't have any issues whatsoever. And I have to say it does run exactly like new. It does have 44,000 original miles on it. It is the GSL model, which would have the disc rear brakes, limited slip, in the rear, uh, upscale interior, uh, rear wiper, cruise control, some additions like that that the GSL would have, uh, which is basically just the top of the line for 1983. Uh, it is really rare that it has all tan interior. I've worked on these cars for a long time and I've only seen one other first gen have all tan leather interior and this is the second one and it's uh, with black exterior. I imagine it's even more rare. Um, I don't know the exact numbers on how many were produced in each color combination, but I'd be willing to bet that it's a very low number that has this exact color combo. It shows really well. There's no rust whatsoever on it. It's completely all original. Original paint, never been in the accidents. Um, you know, it, everything is just presenting itself extremely good for its age. It was really well cared for. Kept in the garage a lot. Didn't see any snow or rain. Um, so basically on the engine on these cars, they are a two rotor, which if you're not familiar with the rotary engine, you can look up different animations and stuff like that on YouTube, but they are completely different than the piston engine counterparts. So this is a two rotor 12A. It displaces 1.15 liter and they round it up to 1.2 and that's where you get the 12A uh, name from is basically it's displacement. They make about 105 horsepower a little over 100 foot-pounds of torque at a 7,000 RPM redline. You could push these to 7,500, 8,000 RPM, but it really didn't make any power uh, after seven. So you were just stretching the motor for no point at all. And you can start to, you know, accelerate engine wear when you take it up to those kind of RPMs on these older 12As. They were carbureted, not fuel injected. It used a four barrel that had smaller primaries and had vacuum actuated secondaries. Um, electronic ignition, they went away from points in like 1980 and went to electronic uh, igniters, but it still has a distributor. Very easy to take the distributor on and off. It has a you know, quick release for the distributor cap. Uh, uses on the oil cooler, it is a water to oil and some call it a beehive. It's right on top of the engine. It's a very compact design and I think that it works extremely well. So it basically just uses radiator coolant to cool down the oil. And you see that in a lot of modern cars, they use a water to oil cooler because it's, it's very compact and it's very effective. Uh, oil filter is right up top. The alternator is right on top. Uh, the air cleaner itself is quick release. So you can change the air filter very easily. Um, maintenance wise, these are not bad to work on whatsoever. And now you would notice this one has like perfect zinc. Uh, all the zinc is really bright gold. You know, all the all the bolts, all the all the metal parts that are zinc plated. And that's one way you can tell low mileage cars. Uh, as always, look at all the zinc parts. If it, if it's really nice and gold, and no corrosion, then it's you know it's a low miles car. 
So the chassis on these, um, they were rear wheel drive, five speed transmission. They were based pretty heavily on the RX-3 that was in the mid to late 70s. It still uses McPherson strut front suspension, but they improved everything on the RX-7. I mean, it didn't share any parts with the RX-3. It just was heavily based on the RX-3. So similar McPherson strut front suspension had a tension rod that led to stamped steel lower control arms. It did have a sway bar on the front and the rear with the GSL model. The uh, base models, some of them didn't have a rear sway bar. I, I don't remember the exact millimeter of the sway bars. I think it's a 27 millimeter front and a 15 millimeter rear, or it's a 23 millimeter front. Um, it had a four link solid axle rear, uh, which was unequal four links. And it had a off-center watts linkage to locate the axle left to right. Would have been a perfect system, except they had to make it off-center. When they made it off-center, you kind of get unbalanced handling to the left and the right under like competition use. So under hardcore racing, guys would just delete this and go to what's called a panhard bar and convert the four-link to a three-link. And that was a lot more competitive and solid in a racing sense. Now, since this is a GSL model, it has disc brakes in the front and the rear. They were ventilated single piston front and non-ventilated single piston rear. The weight for the whole car, uh, right at 2350, 2400 pounds. Um, their handling was extremely good. It, for only having a 185 on a 13 inch wheel tire stock, uh, not a lot of rubber but they did pull over 0.85 or 0.86 G's on the skid pad. And you could definitely tell driving them at the time, there wasn't very many cars that could out handle an RX-7 with a very, very tiny engine located well behind the shock towers. They had a very close to 50-50 weight balance and were very lightweight. So you combine that with an engine that was very uh, uh, excitable, you know, like it, it wanted to be ran hard. It, it was a very fun and rewarding car to drive through any kind of corner or, you know, mountain roads or anything that involved actual handling and braking. Even in the racing world, which IMSA was going on at the time, Mazda won a lot in IMSA. There was a GTU and a GTO class. They did extremely well in GTU, which was two and a half liters and under. And they also did pretty well in GTO, which was two and a half liters and over. And uh, they used the 13B, later the three rotor, and at the very end of things, and towards 91, they ran a four rotor, which was you know considerably bigger, more powerful power plant. But they uh, they did really well. In fact, the RX-7 is still the most winning car in IMSA history. All right, so here's a little uh, end car driving on the 83 RX-7. I don't know if I said it, probably have a few times, but this is the GSL model. So 83 GSL. All tan interior, black exterior. I've, I've never in my life actually seen a black with tan, all tan 83 RX-7, so it's definitely on the rare side. Now these cars, the uh, you know, were really fun cars, and I know it's probably cliche to talk about how fun they are because they're not known for, you know, a whole bunch of speed. Um, they were only rated at a little over 100 horsepower. I think this one would have been like 103. 7,000 RPM redline, little 12A engine. So this was a 1.1 uh, liter rotary engine. A lot of people double it since it's kind of like a two-stroke. So it's sort of like a 2.2 liter if you're putting it in piston engine terms. But they're not nearly as efficient. So you know, to, if you double it, it takes away some of the merits of the small compact rotary. They did have a four-barrel carburetor, very similar to like the old V8s. Uh, this has a primary and secondary, so up to about 3,500, around 4,000. It has a vacuum, vacuum that actuates the, the secondary uh, throttle body, so you basically get a two-stage four-barrel carburetor. Later on, the, the year following this, 1984, the GSL did come out with a 13B engine, which is a 1.3 liter rotary, and also had fuel injection. I remember I owned my very first car was actually an 83 GSL RX-7, very similar to this. Gray and with black interior, way worse condition. And it was a dog. Uh, something was just not right with it. It was very, very, very slow. Uh, 
and then I remember later I you know, got a modifying RX-7s and uh, built, quote unquote, built a 12A. Had a Delordo aftermarket two barrel carburetor, full header exhaust system, and that would gain about 50 horsepower over stock, so it went from 100 to 150. And it was a pretty quick car for, for what it was, and I was just a you know, 17 year old kid. But then I bought a GSLSE. And in stock form, that GSLSE with 200 some thousand miles would almost run neck and neck with the modified 12 -day. So the GSLSE was definitely a leg up. Um, it was 135 horsepower and like 130 foot pounds, whereas the 12 was 100 horsepower with 100 foot pounds. So these aren't going to take your breath away driving them. Uh, even in 1983, they weren't considered a very fast car. I think 0 to 60 times on this was like in the 8.6 second range and the quarter mile in just over 16 seconds. 16 seconds nowadays, I mean, even your cheapest economy car is probably going to be in the 16 second range. This is definitely not like your ultra high performance vehicle. But I have to say, driving them is still extremely fun. It's uh, got responsive handling, a little bit big on the center of the steering wheel. But you get used to that pretty fast. Uh, mainly it's just they're very fun to toss around. I mean these only weigh 2,300 pounds so even with 100 horsepower I mean it's, it's it gets up and does its job. Respectable mid-range. It's not like it's a super peaky engine where all its power is up top. It has a pretty good mid-range power to it. Gas mileage on these if you're really wailing into them you know 15 15, 16 miles an hour. Or gas mileage on these, if you're driving them hard, would get down into the 15 mile per gallon range, 16 mile per gallon. If you're taking it easy and you're driving it really slow and you're really trying to conserve fuel, you can get into the 20s, you know, 22, 23 mile per gallon range. But most of the time, on average, you're probably going to land right around 18, 19. The transmission in these are actually pretty nice. I mean, I've driven all different types of cars. S2000 shines out as obviously one of the best transmissions, but the first gen transmission really wasn't bad. It, it, uh, it was direct. It's very short for especially the time frame. It's a really, it's not all tall, and, and you know the shifter bushings are really tight when everything's new. Only uh, you know when they got some serious miles on them, and both bushings would deteriorate and fall out. Would you get any kind of free play? The shifter's always snug always direct you never had a hard time finding the gear and you know this car came out in 1979 but in 81 they revised the transmission it used to have the stick kind of come out to the center console uh, well up on the radio in 81 they relocated it back further and they shortened up the shifter itself it's very noticeable i mean the 79 80s were fun to drive but the shifter was i might be a little on the long side 81 to 85 they improved it drastically really enjoy them a lot. They're very direct. Probably one of the better shifters I've felt of everything I've driven. And for the 80s, it's pretty damn impressive. Throttle response is not as fast as you'd expect for being a rotary engine. Uh, there's very little moving parts, and there's not a lot of rotational mass that's spinning. But Mazda felt the need to put a very heavy flywheel on these, and that was mostly to help with accelerating off the line. They don't have a lot of inertia, so they don't have a lot of inertial torque. And it's not a lack of just torque in general, it's, it's the actual mass of the engine. When you let the clutch out at lower RPM, these don't have a lot there. So a Mazda's answer to that was to put a roughly 30 pound flywheel on them, uh, not the air conditioning on, which makes it worse. But you know, you take it up to 1500 RPM, you let out the clutch, and it's very easy to drive. I've seen people that are even new to driving stick, you know, drive all these very easily. They're uh, not difficult to drive. They don't, they're not easy to stall. And uh, it's just the downside to all that mass of the flywheel is the revving is not super fast. This one runs really well. Sometimes when you get to low mileage examples that are this old, uh, being an 83 model, you know, it's uh, 38 years old. That means it probably spent a lot of time sitting. Rotor engines, when they sit, don't exactly care. 
the only downside is there's some rubber seals inside these engines. You know, the coil seals are, are rubber based. All the O-rings for the oil pressure system are rubber based. And those seals have a tendency to get hard. And through engine heat cycling, you can seep coolant into the engine from the coolant seals, which will have to require a rebuild, unfortunately. Or the oil seals get hard and you'll get very small oil leaks on the outside of the engine. Um, some of them can be fixed externally, you know, like underneath the oil pedestal, for example. And some of them require an engine teardown, like it was the, you know, the dowel pins. Both of those are really unfortunate because, uh, you know, dowel pin o-ring is like a $2 part. But the only way to access it is to unstack the engine, the, the sandwich assembly of the rotary. It's the only way to basically get access to those internal o-rings. So those are some of the things you kind of come up across with the first gen. It's a lightly accelerated. So, you know, that's 7,000 RPM, no problem at all. We're up to 50 miles an hour. And that was 60. I'm just testing it because I did a carburetor rebuild on this car. It runs extremely good. The secondary isn't working flawlessly. There's no stuttering, no bucking, no hesitation. Everything's working as it should. Yeah, this is great. This is a successful rebuild of the carburetor. The clutch hydraulics are working well. I use a lot of times RX-8 spark plugs in these. It's getting harder to get the original RX-7 spark plugs. And uh, so I've moved over to the RX-8s. RX-8s are easy to get. The iridium with the very small uh, ignition point I feel like it's a better burn for these 12 a's but you never want to skimp on doing the uh, ignition systems on rotaries. A lot of guys have a lot of problems that they don't need to have if they just replace spark plugs. Uh, oil changes, spark plugs, ignition systems. Uh, and change your coolant once in a while. Uh, the rotary is not very difficult to maintain. You just have to do very basic things to it. The brakes on these cars, I actually like the brakes on the car. They they have enough assist to give you some extra strength, but they're not over overly assisted or overly powered. It's just enough to help you, but not where it's like you just touch them and the car you know, hits the brakes. It's, some cars are just like overly assisted brakes. These are a perfect blend. And they hold up pretty well, like if you're using it on the street. It's, uh, I've never experienced brake fade after repeated hard braking sessions. I grew up with these. I've had probably 17 first gen RX 7s. Most of them, all the RX 7s I've owned just been first gens. And all of them have been fun to drive. And when you modify them, you have to you know, do it tastefully. You don't want to overpower the chassis because it is a very narrow car. They're not very wide. And they have very narrow tires. You can you know, put larger wheels and tires on them, things like that. But they, I don't think this chassis was made to handle much more than 400 horsepower. And beyond that, it gets kind of funky feeling. So, yeah, I mean, really, they're, they're a fun car to drive, and they're becoming extremely collectible now. Especially examples like this that are low mileage. Let's talk about the sound inside. So, I mean, some could almost knock it. It's so quiet in here that you barely hear the rotary engine. Um, it has a unique sound. I, I can hear the fan kick on, and it's louder than the exhaust of the engine. So the exhaust on these cars were very, very quiet. If you ever see a review and they talk about how loud an RX-7 is from the factory, then it's not a factory RX-7. All factory RX-7s were very quiet. All first gens, all second gens, all third gens. Mazda used a lot of mufflers, big catalytic converters, and they took what is known as one of the loudest engines they made it extremely quiet. Uh, many people want to put an aftermarket exhaust on it just so they can hear it a little bit better. Myself, it would depend if I would put an aftermarket exhaust on or not. I really enjoy how quiet they are because it's relaxing. As you get older, you just kind of want that. But it's nice to actually hear the engine somewhat too. Racing Beauty, I feel like, has a good blend of that. None of you guys can hear it. That's mostly the fan right there. The fan's kicked off because they AC. So the fan is like the loudest thing. But the, the engine note, you know, you hear it. It has a cool sound to it. And the fan kicked off. That's third gear. It's enough to 
let you know that it's running, obviously. But it's not, uh, it's not totally loud. Racing B, as I said, makes an exhaust system that's a pretty good blend. It's not as quiet as stock, but it is reasonable where you're not going to heat drive the car. Most people that own these cars are probably an older demographic at this point. And most of the older demographic does not appreciate a really loud exhaust, myself included. Now some of you may be laughing because I'm the same guy, yes I am the same guy that owns a four-rotor race car that has straight pipes. Uh, it's a race car, what can I say, I don't drive that car on the street. Is it street legal? Vaguely. But I don't drive it very often, I, mean, I drive it maybe twice a year on the street for a very short period of time. And when I'm racing it, I have nice little earplugs that go in and a helmet. On the racetrack, it's a completely different story. I like it to be loud, it's kind of um, it draws a crowd where it goes. But any of my daily drivers, I don't I don't enjoy extremely loud cars for daily. I mean, all my cars that I daily drive are stock. We have a 2020 Stinger, all stock. My Ram 3500, all stock. Nothing done to them. And uh, so I guess there's something that comes with age, mostly with age, as you appreciate factory vehicles. And this car right here, this is 100% stock, and I really enjoy it. If you ever think about getting into an RX-7 like this, there's a few things to look out for. But I'd say that they're really reliable, well-built cars. These don't have any known major electrical issues to deal with, unlike many of the European models of the same year. So electrical's really solid, the engine's really solid, transmissions hold up really well, the rear ends hold up really well. Um, Everything's really robust and well built and steel on this car. There's hardly any aluminum, you know, very little use of like plastic. Uh, all your suspension components are stamped steel, the rear end is steel, all the legs are steel, rubber bushings, no hind joints. All that stuff was for cost, but as a byproduct made them very reliable because they're just kind of a no nonsense, low technology kind of setup that relied on a really well made system as opposed to lots of electronics and gizmos. You know, for if you compare this to like a 280Z, I think it'd be a 280ZX 1983. The ZX was all about technology and, and it, it gained a lot of weight and girth and it was, you know, it was fatter and the engine went from a, you know, a higher RPM straight six 2.4 liter to a lower RPM 2.8 liter and everything just got larger and more lethargic. And Mazda stuck with the same DNA that they started with when she came out after the 240Z. But they followed the 240Z, the original 240Z formula, you know, really lightweight, really simple, uh, really inexpensive, and just relied on it being uh, a lightweight, fun, well-balanced car. A solid axle rear suspension you would never think would be fun to drive because everything leading up to this you know, muscle cars and stuff like that, they weren't known for their excellent handling, handling characteristics. But a live axle can handle really well. I mean, even today we have Trans Am running a solid rear axle and racing because it has to. And NASCAR up to very recently were solid axle rear ends. So you can obviously make them handle extremely well. They're never going to be an independent suspension. But does it really matter? I mean, it's more of a brochure that you're checking off on the booklet than what most people are probably going to notice driving these cars. If I didn't tell somebody that this was a solid rear axle, I'm not 100% convinced that the average driver would know until they put their head under there. I can't say as far as an advantage of the solid axle, I've driven these cars in the wintertime a lot, and <clears throat> they're considerably easier to drive in the winter than a second gen or something that has independent rear suspension. The solid axle just has much better traction characteristics uh, and poor conditions like heavy rain or snow. Not that I recommend driving any of these classics in snow anymore unless it's just a total write-off kind of first gen. They're getting too valuable. and uh, But at least you know that it, you can't do it. And it's more of a, a point of view from if you purchased this in 1983 you know, what the average person was going to do with it. A lot of people took their 
RX-7s through the snow because uh, they had to. You know, they got a sports car, they didn't have anything else to drive, so they drove their RX-7. So I'm hoping that I convey kind of what this car is like to drive. I didn't hit like a bunch of corners or anything. I'm not going to hammer on this car and, you know, drive it in an extra, extra kind of fashion. It is a collectible and it's not mine. And I definitely appreciate the owner letting me do a quick review on it. I'm hoping to do more like this on more customer cars because I have plenty of customer cars that I do day in, day out. That's what I do for a living. So race the four rotor arc seven and you've probably seen some of those videos but I, um, every day i'm working on rx sevens like this one uh, so this is the first of hopefully many to come i definitely enjoy driving it and uh, it's kind of like going back in time for me so it's a neat car definitely cool so that concludes uh reviewing this thing and uh, you know don't forget to like and subscribe for more and any questions or whatever I'd post them down in the comment section. I'm usually pretty responsive about replying to any kind of questions that you have. You can check out my website at defiantautoworks.com. And uh, if you have an RX-7 that needs any kind of work or want to do performance modifications to it, uh, feel free to hit me up because I, that's all I do is work on RX-7s and RX-8s.